Well, good morning. Isn't that great? That, friends, is what the church and the kingdom of heaven is all about. I just would give God another praise offering on that. That is just awesome. And I want to welcome you to our second week uh, in our current series where we are taking the questions that you have submitted to us uh, as, as a worship team uh, and we're trying to help you understand. Now I want to give a big shout out to our folks that do promotions here at the church uh, because in worship planning, we, uh, uh, the pastors kind of come up with an idea, uh, kind of the direction we want to go and then we hand it off to our promotions team uh, to develop a, a visual that helps connect us. And I have to just say, uh, I've been looking at this visual now now, not only for the weeks we've been doing the series, but, but for the weeks leading up to it. And I have to say, it has really caused me some pause. I think many of us, if we were honest, we would say that we're pretty much like this person over here. Uh, and we probably desire to be like this person over here. But as I have looked at that, that graphic, I realize there is not a clear indication of the direction of whatever that is that is going between the two of them. I've also, as I have been studying this, uh, realized that, that maybe what we think over here is all neat and orderly may not be our real objective. Uh, maybe uh, that means that we are so set in our ways, uh, so inflexible that we are not willing to allow God to speak into us. And, and so in some sense, maybe a, a combination of those two is really a healthy approach to where we want to be. Uh, so last week, and I also want to give you know, props to Pastor Amy, uh, she drew the straw for the first week of eternal judgment. And there is a saying in the Bible, pride goes before the fall. And so I'm sitting on the sidelines kind of snickering. She gets the eternal judgment one. And then I began working on suffering for today. And, and I realized that she may have gotten off easy. I drew the, the, the short stick on this one. And so I began really looking at some of, uh, some of the things that were out there about suffering. I even went to my small groups over the last couple of weeks and said, tell me about suffering in your life. Uh, and my Monday group that meets uh, at seven o'clock at Panera, guys, if anybody wants to join us, uh, I brought that up at the table and we went around and everybody that was there last week talked about their own understanding of suffering. Uh, and as it all came to a conclusion, one of, uh, one of the people sitting next to me, who, who is really kind of one of my mentors, uh, said to me, Pastor Jim, I am sure that you have probably preached on suffering many times in your pastoral life. I go, yeah. And this person said to me, so what are you going to do different this time to really speak to the heart of suffering? And I didn't have an answer. And, and I left our meeting last Monday going, wow. So, so I come to church and I, I, I'm ready, you know, to begin thinking about this, really fleshing it out, going deeper in what I've already, uh, already had gathered. Uh, and, and no sooner than I had that, then, then I was checking email and I'm on a, on a news feed uh, with a bunch of pastors. And there's encouraging things that that news feed sends out. Uh, so, so my first thing that I checked uh, after being challenged, what are you going to say differently uh, than you've ever said before? Uh, this uh, particular little cartoon popped up. Dear pastor, we expect you to teach us the prophetic words of Jesus. But remember, your pay is contingent upon not upsetting us. <laughs> I wondered if that was a message from God. And then as I began to wrestle with that, then, then almost, you know, within minutes, another one pops up that says, if you want everyone to like you, don't be a pastor. <laughs> Sell ice cream instead. So I thought about going to, uh, you know, steak and shake and getting a little hat. Uh, but then I realized God had placed me here uh, to really talk about suffering. Because you folks gave us those questions. Questions that we sum up into this. Help me understand suffering. I mean, questions like, why is there suffering? Questions like, if there is a God who is loving and who is caring and all powerful, why does God allow people to suffer? You know, the classic one, why do good people suffer? Or the harder one, like, why do God, why does God allow children or loved ones or elderly people or anyone to suffer? And so here we go. 
I, I discovered uh, that, that, you know, when we talk about the word suffering, suffering is, is any kind of hurt or irritation or disruption from the expected flow of our life's script. Every one of us has in our minds a life script of how we want it to play out. And when it is disrupted, when it is interrupted, when, when something happens and that, that script is thrown out, then we find ourselves in suffering. Suffering can be physical suffering. Uh, it can be emotional suffering. It can be relational suffering. It can be financial suffering. And most often it is spiritual suffering. So as I thought about how do, we, how do I say something different this year, this time, uh, about suffering, I began thinking about the number of audiences that are present for a suffering conversation. And really, I decided there's really two main audience. There is an audience that is suffering through the life or through the eyes of a believer. A person who has put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Just like we saw Abby do. Just like this afternoon uh, that we will witness, uh, you know, a, a couple handful of young people commit through confirmation. They have put their life, their trust, their faith in Christ. And then there's the other group. Uh, so those who are suffering through the eyes or through the life of a person who is a not yet believer. And, and I have discovered there are two entirely different conversations. Uh, you cannot have the same conversation with those who are grounded in scripture and growing in their faith and, and those who have yet to discover the reality of faith. So this morning I want to start first with those who are in the faith, those who have a life in Christ. And, and the best place to address suffering uh, is going straight to the word of God, to the Bible. Because that's, where, that's, that's our book. Uh, that, is, that is God's instructions for us to live out our life. It, it is our guide for believers to discover the abundant life that had been promised by Jesus. Now, we could go through the Bible, and if you Google scripture, uh, scripture verses about suffering, you'll see there's about, you know, a thousand or so in the Bible. Uh, and you could easily arm yourself with all of those scriptures, reading them and, and having that conversation uh, with other believers about, you know, the rain falling on the just and the unjust. Uh, you know, there, there's several of them there. But I realize that, that suffering, human suffering, human suffering from the perspective of a believer is much more complicated than just grabbing a handful, cherry-picking scriptures uh, that sum up that entire diverse scope of suffering that happens. Uh, you know, uh, we need to develop a better understanding. I mean, suffering has always gotten a bad rap anyway. Uh, it's like we've been, we've been forced to believe that, that suffering is a condition we just have to tolerate. It is a condition that is endured as a punishment uh, be, for our personal sins uh, because we have angered God. I grew up in a franchise that I felt like God was watching with a finger on a zap button waiting for me to do something wrong. How many times have you heard someone say, or maybe you've said it, Oh, they are having such bad luck. They must have really done something terrible in their lives, and that's God's way of punishing them. Or maybe you've even felt, you know, I'm suffering so much, God must have it in for me. God must really hate me. God must have abandoned me. I mean, this was kind of the mindset of the, of the Old Testament Jewish traditions, and somehow we have been able to package that and skillfully preserve it and hand it off to modern-day Christianity. Uh, in fact, in modern day Christianity, we have a, a, a really inadequate theology of suffering. Uh, we have developed this because we have drawn and, and allowed and invited and, and accepted uh, and blended together a mix of, of popular pop psychology. We have drawn together some non-biblical traditions. We have seeded it with a smorgasbord of worldly ideas in hopes to enlighten our own personal suffering. But friends, as informed disciples, as followers of Jesus, as representatives of the kingdom of heaven, we must help ourselves first and then others move beyond myths that exist about suffering. We need to once again discover a solid biblical divine view of suffering. God's view is absolute. 
And God's view is one that is essential for believers to be able to speak to believers about understanding and handling suffering. God's word is is over and over, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, shows that suffering is part of the human experience and part of the Christian life. Let me tell you what suffering is not. Suffering is not in itself virtuous. Suffering is not a sign of greater holiness. Suffering is not a way for us to gain brownie points with God and give us a better spot in the kingdom of heaven. But what suffering is, what the biblical narrative teaches us about God's view and the reality of our suffering, number one, suffering is normal. It is unavoidable and it is inevitable in the Christian life. Do you remember the the blind man uh, that Jesus and the disciples encountered in the Gospel of John? And and the disciples in in their kind of uh, off-base theology of suffering said, Who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, Neither have sinned. This man, Jesus said, was born blind. It was inevitable. It was predictable. It was part of but not because he was born blind but with that he was born blind the work of God may be shown through him a second reason that is suffering is possible is we suffer because we live in a fallen world we're in the state of spiritual warfare where sin reigns rampant in the hearts of every person Paul says in Romans we all sin we all fall short of God's glory and behind all that is Satan who is who is leading an all-out rebellion against God and the forces of good well friends I have read the back of the book And I know that the outcome of that spiritual warfare that we are engaged in has already been determined. And this is that we will be victorious. We'll be victorious eternally uh, in spite of or over our earthly struggles. Third thing is that we suffer, possibly because of our own foolishness. I'm a great example of that. We could spend the rest of the time we have and all the way into the afternoon, me just sharing with you stories of my foolishness uh, and the resultant suffering that comes with that. Uh, We reap what we sow is what Paul says in Galatians 6. I, I think enough said about that. But then to make it worse, and maybe this is even another reason of suffering, even worse, there are many times my foolishness will not only cause me to suffer, but it will also cause others to suffer as well. And to me, that is a great travesty. That because of my foolishness, my reaping what I have sown, other people have to suffer as well. And scripture tells us that there are times we suffer because it is, it is, It is God's discipline. Hebrews 12, 7 and 8 says this, God is educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as a dear child. This trouble you're experiencing isn't punishment. Instead, it's training. It's training the normal experience of a child. Only an irresponsible parent will leave a child to fend completely for themselves. Would you prefer an irresponsible God who allows us to run rampant? No, God reels us in at times. Friends, we suffer persecution because of our faith, especially when we take a stand on biblical issues. It, with the suffering for righteousness is what the Bible calls it in 2 Timothy. God didn't prevent Jesus from suffering. He didn't prevent Paul or Peter or Jonah or Job or any of the others that he loved in the Bible from suffering. And why should we, who are his followers, his disciples, his modern day representatives, his kingdom on earth, should we expect any less? In fact, Jesus tells the disciples before he leaves, <laughs> If you think I had it bad, wait, the world will come against you. Now, in, in spite of all that, there's some good things that can possibly come. Suffering, suffering happens for the believer 
in community. You see, the church body, the the community of faith is not to be a loosely bound association of spiritual lone rangers doing things on their own. Paul even confronts this this loneliness, this separation, this I'm, I'm on my own idea when he writes in Galatians 2. He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Jesus. The church body, you and I folks, Every one of us here, those who who answered with Abby, those who who, who applauded her becoming part of the body of Christ, the kingdom of God here at sunrise is meant to be a refuge for people who are suffering. When, When one of us is hurting, the church family applies the band-aid. When, when, when one of us is down, the, the church family encourages lifting up. When one of us is in need, the church family comes alongside. Friends, in my previous life, I don't know how many times I heard people say that when they were going through a tragedy, when they were grieving the loss of the loved one, they would say, I don't know how I could have done this without the support of my church family. Suffering is best happening in community. Also, suffering, suffering can equip us for ministry for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, firsthand experience in, in matters of suffering as a believer uh, equips us for ministry. Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians that God comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, God brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times so that we can be there for that person, just as God was there through somebody else for us. I think think of Paul and Silas in the prison uh, in Philippi, and and there they were singing praise songs at midnight after having been beating, and they were suffering, and and it, it, it infected the jailer. They became a witness to the jailer who brought him to Christ and his whole family. So, So really, suffering... Suffering of any type through the lens, the eyes of a believer may ultimately have the effect to draw us together as families. It may have the effect to draw us together as a faith community. It may cause stronger bounds to be drawn together as a larger community gathering of people. Suffering shared diminishes our individual suffering. You hear that, friends? When we share our suffering with the community of believers, it diminishes the pain of our suffering. Now, I know that's a lot, lot to digest in a few minutes. I mean, that's a lot, of, a lot of Bible verses that I could throw out at you, and there's some pretty challenging theology, even for the most seasoned or invested disciple to even accept, let alone process. And if you think it's hard for us, what about those who we then have conversations with who have not yet been able to find the comfort from suffering because they don't yet know Jesus. So here's what I want to share about that. My message, which I hope would be your message, which would be our message, our message for the not yet believer is simply this. Write it down. Use few words, if any at all. In other words, there's nothing you're going to say to a person that is not a believer of Christ, especially uh, if they have not been fully exposed to the power of the scriptures or they've not yet experienced the grace and unconditional love of God. In fact, you may only be adding more misery and confusion and frustration and pain and hurt when you come up with all of those great cherry-picked verses that you know. So therefore at least for me, and I pray for you, the most powerful witness that we can have will be in our own personal way that we deal with suffering in our lives. That our own times of disappointment, our own times of trial, our own times when life goes off the rails. Live your life in good times and in challenging times in such a way that those who have not yet said yes to Christ, when they have questions about suffering, they'll look at you and they'll go, wow, I want to know what they know. 
I want to be able to endure my suffering like they endure their suffering. They will say, I want, I, want, I want a desire to have that peace that passes human understanding that is evident in your life through your trials and suffering that isn't evident in theirs. The greatest witness that we can have to other folks who are not yet followers of Jesus cannot effectively be expressed in words until they invite us in. In preparation for this, I had a conversation with lots of folks this week. Uh, and one of, the, one of those is a family going through some pretty intense suffering uh, right now. Uh, and this person said, you know, I work, in a, I work in an environment where most of the people that I'm around uh, do not have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, some of them are even professing, you know, no belief in something whatsoever. But they have witnessed and watched how our family has gone through this time of trial and suffering. Uh, and now they have been coming to my friend and asking, would you, would you pray for me? Because we're going through something in our family. Now, if we would have tried, if that person would have tried to force their faith when the persons in that office weren't ready, then they would have done harm. But it was observing how each person suffers in such a way that points to Jesus. It cannot be expressed in normal words. One last verse, the sixth verse of 1 Peter chapter one, simply says this. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Final thought. I received this from another person who, who knew that I was working uh, on what to share about suffering. And, and I think they heard this like Thursday on Joy FM and they sent it to me. It says God's way, God's way for each of us is perfect. We may for a season Season is an undetermined amount of time. We may for a season interpret it as suffering, but God's plan will eventually be made known to us. It leaves us only with the ability to trust God that God's will, God's will will be done. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus, we are to never lose hope. We're to cling to the promises that God has given us. And we're to come together as a community of believers and encourage and hold and nurture and love on each other. It doesn't take suffering away, but people will witness and testify that it makes it somewhat more bearable. And in the process, if just one person sees that and is drawn closer to God, then maybe our suffering, our trials, our struggles are worth it. Let us pray. God, as we come here this day, Lord, we, uh, we seek as believers, as followers, as those who desire to grow more faith-filled, your spirit in us. Lord, our humanness and our human ideas fall far short of us really understanding what it means to follow you. So Lord, we are here today for you to help us. Reach out to us in our time of suffering and in our hurt and our disbelief and our frustration and our confusion and point us to those places in your word that we find hope. Point us to those people in our lives that have been there that have experienced that, that you desire to walk alongside of us. Lord, help us also to be aware that how we respond, others will be watching. Give us, give us a light that shines to you so that others may come to know you as well. God, we, uh, we come here also to celebrate the joy of knowing that you have not left us on our own. Through the celebration of Holy Communion, we are reminded, Lord, of how you share with us your grace that is greater than our sin and your love for each of us that is unconditional. 
Lord, we have prepared the offering to you of the bread and the cup. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that as we have opportunity today, we share in the glory of what you bring to us. Lord, we desire you to speak into our hearts once more. And then also, Lord, pour out your spirit upon us so that we might truly grow in our faith, in our faith journey with you. We pray that in your name. Amen.